Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to be doing a guide on how to close out games. You guys have been asking me about this a lot, so we're going to go through all the steps as well as the common pitfalls you might face when closing out games. I'm also going to follow this up with a guide on how to stall out games, but for now we'll just be focusing on closing out games. As always, everything is timestamped below. Let's get into it. So the first thing we need to understand for closing out games is the mid game step. So this is something that if you've watched my mid game guide might be familiar to you, um, but let's imagine your blue side. So in the mid game, basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to control a quadrant of the enemy's jungle um, near the objective that's about to spawn and make it difficult for the enemy team to contest you on an objective. So in this example is imagine you're a blue team and the dragon is the next objective to spawn. So what we would want to do here, there's a couple steps. First, we want to push the side lane. So let's say, let's say this tower is down. We want to push the side lane, push this wave in and make the enemy show on the wave. And then what we want to do is we want to come up here and we want to drop a little bit of vision. With our vision here, we're now more able, more easily able to push the side lane further, which we can then use to get deeper vision. So to kind of show this for you, step one of the mid game is pushing the side wave, making your opponent show on the wave. Step two is to take some shallow vision in the enemy jungle quadrant. Step three is to then use that vision to push the wave further up. And then step four is to take deeper vision in the enemy jungle quadrant. And this is going to be the role for most people in the mid game. Um, it's the same for the ADC support in jungle. It's a bit different from whoever's playing weak side, but I would say if you want to know exactly what to do in that case, um, check out my mid game guide. But in general, the person on weak side would just be trying to survive. So let me just quickly explain the reasons for each of these steps. The reason you have to push this wave first, uh, the first step, is that if you don't do this, it's possible that the enemy jungler or the enemy mid laner is just sitting here. Once they actually show on the wave, you know they're not there, so you can take some shallow vision. With that shallow vision, we're then able to push up further because, you know, without it, pushing up here would make you very vulnerable. If you didn't have these wards, it'd be very easy for the enemy jungler or support to come down here and kill you. So that's why we kind of need a two-step process of, like, pushing the wave, warding, um, and then a third step of pushing the wave further and finally warding again. It, the reason we want like really deep control over the enemy jungle is because it's going to make contesting objectives really, really easy. As you'll see in the examples I'm about to show you, um, when you have control of this area and you have the enemy quadrant uh, very like controlled and, and kind of lit up with a bunch of wards, it just makes fighting a lot, lot easier. So the biggest pitfall you're going to run into when executing the mid game steps is actually skipping steps. So to remind you, you need to push a wave, take vision, push the wave further and take deeper vision. Now in this example here, if you look at the map, we have full control of this enemy topside jungle. So the steps for the enemy team are to push the mid wave, make us show on the mid wave and then they can look to regain control. Now if they skip a step and don't make us show on the wave before entering their jungle, they're at high risk of dying. So they should know here that you know their step is just to push this mid wave. And if you actually look here, if they push the mid wave, we will be forced to walk all the way around back to that tower. And because they don't, because Diana just skips a step and tries to regain control, tries to get some wards by herself, um, without pushing the wave first, it's very easy for us to make a pick here and this ends up turning into a very one fight even though the game is pretty much completely even. So it's really really important guys that you do uh, stick to those steps, those mid game steps when you are looking uh, to close out games in the mid game because any deaths that you have um, will not only slow the game down significantly in terms of tempo, but will also give gold back to the enemy team. That makes winning subsequent fights more difficult. Another pitfall that I think people run into when they're doing these mid-game steps is forgetting to catch waves. So something that I always say is you want to try push out waves about a minute and a half before a dragon. Then you, you know you execute your mid-game steps, you get all the control, then you keep your control, and it makes it difficult for the enemy to contest the objective. Now, if you don't push out waves in time, uh, you're left in a very rough spot. So let's pause this game right here and have a look. Here we actually do have very good control over the dragon, but what are the problems? The bot wave is getting pushed in, which means no matter what fight happens here, we're actually going to lose a fair amount of gold anyway. On top of that, the top wave is being pushed in too, which means Renekton can't really join the fight as he doesn't have TP. So basically, Despite having a very favorable situation around the dragon, whatever outcome comes out of this is not going to be as favorable as it looks, because even if we get kills here, we lost a huge amount of gold bot, and on top of that, Renekton is not going to be able to get to this. So basically, it's like 
while you want to have control of the objective, it's also really important that you don't neglect the waves around it. Don't just like sit on your control forever. Try and like get that deep quadrant vision, but make sure you keep pushing waves in the side lane um, up until like maybe 30 seconds before the dragon or objective actually spawns. Otherwise, even if you win a fight, it's not going to be as good as you think it is because there's going to be so much gold kind of just lost to you know, random waves dying and stuff like that. So if you execute the mid game steps correctly, there's two big advantages you should come away with. The first is obviously just having more gold. If you're always like executing the mid game steps correctly, you should be pushing sideways, should be taking control of their jungle, can maybe look to take camps and stuff like that. So you should have more golden XP than your opponent, which obviously makes winning a fight at an objective easier. The second big thing is that you should have a big positional advantage. So with having vision all over their jungle, it makes it easy to make picks on them when they come in. Um, it's easier to make decisions because you see what they're doing at all the time. And also they're the ones that have to walk into you where they don't have vision and you can kind of just wait for them. You can pick them or chunk them on the way in. So basically, as you'll see here, the combination of having a better position as well as having more gold and XP should make winning fights at objectives much, much easier. And that's going to be kind of the backbone of how we close out games. Objective fights in solo queue are extremely, extremely important. So this is kind of the first thing that you really need to have in your mind and be able to execute to at least a decent level in order to close out games more consistently. Now, the mid game steps should make winning objective fights significantly easier. But what you do after the objective fight is probably even more important. So this is a skill that I noticed you guys are very, very bad at, something that comes up in coaching sessions a lot. But after 20 minutes, as soon as you win a fight, you're Thoughts need to immediately go to can we Baron or not? So things you should consider, you know, how many members of the enemy team are dead? What kind of DPS do, do we have? Um, you know, who on the enemy team is dead? Like, is it their jungler versus, say, their support? Um, you know, how much DPS do we have on the Baron? How long is it going to take us to get there? You know, basically... It is a skill, um, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, but assessing whether or not you can do Baron is an extremely important skill, because if you get Baron, it speeds up the game a lot. Now, one thing that you guys are probably going to say is, well, sometimes my teammates just don't do Baron, and, you know, you're absolutely right. This does happen in solo queue a lot. I would say probably my, like, general guideline for this is after 20 minutes, if you win a fight and two or more of the enemy team are dead, if you spam a bunch of pings on Baron, a bunch of assist pings, your team will probably go and do it. But if they don't, don't worry. Um, and we're just going to do the other step, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But yeah, basically, there's a lot of times I see in coaching sessions and stuff like that, that uh, a big team fight has won post 20 minutes and it doesn't convert into a Baron or anything. So even if your team doesn't have the best DPS, oftentimes, like if you've killed a significant number of the enemy team, you can just run to Baron and you can actually do it uh, before they can get back on the map. So that's really, really important to think about. Okay, so if you win that team fight and you've decided that you can't do Baron either because your team doesn't want to um, or just because you don't have the damage for it or not enough people are dead, whatever the reason, if you win a fight, um, it can even be before 20 minutes, but just for whatever reason that you can't do Baron, your goal is instead to spread out on the map as much as possible and try to take as much gold away from the enemy team as you can. So this means pushing waves into towers. It can mean taking towers. It can mean taking enemy jungle camps basically you want to use that team fight win to get as much stuff as possible so something i see really often is people just immediately reset after winning a fight and generally unless you literally can't stand the map at all that's really bad because it's a very good time to just get a ton of gold so you can see and this let example here, even before 20 minutes, we were able to take um, like two mid waves. We were able to get damage on the mid and bot tower. I think actually we ended up getting the, yeah, we actually ended up getting the mid and bot tower. We took the enemy Raptor camp. So there was like a huge amount of gold that we were able to get after that team fight win, even though in this case, well, Baron hasn't even spawned, but we can't do the Baron here, right? So there's a lot of stuff you can get out of a team fight win, even if it's not a Baron. One quick thing to add is while I did say you want to take as much stuff as possible, if you're later in the game, so let's say like 30 minutes or so, it's important important not to reset too late because if you take too long to reset you know if you spend say another 40 seconds on the map trying to get as much gold as possible at a high level enemy teams can deploy back on the map and instantly start the baron which you might not encounter that much on low elo but definitely as you go higher up it's more and more common so make sure you keep track of the enemy death timers and try based so you're back on the map at around the same time as them a really common pitfall i see is that when people decide to do baron they mis-execute it horribly so one thing that i think is really important to keep in mind 
is what is your role? Um, so this is something I've talked about in many other videos, but if you think of a champ like um, Zoe, LeBlanc, Akali, Zed, all these champions, they don't have great DPS on Baron, right? So instead, your goal is to try to prevent people to get from the Baron. You can see here while my team is DPSing the Baron, there's not much point me doing it because, well, I just don't add that much. I can add a little DPS over the wall because people aren't here yet, uh, but I just don't want to DPS it really. If you're a champion like Cassio, you instead might just want to be DPSing the Baron a lot, or if you're an ADC champ. Um, if you're a champion like Zillion or Victor, you might be trying to DPS the Baron while also controlling a choke, you know? You you can add a lot to the fight while also still adding a lot to the Baron. So it's really important that when you're doing Baron, you think like, what is my role like within the Baron? Because I often see, you know, um, say Zoe's or LeBlanc's in very bad positions, like just DPSing the Baron, not really adding anything. Or I'll see very high DPS champions, you know, Lucian's or Cassius, looking to cheese people in a bush when it's much better if they just DPS the Baron. So that's another thing to think about as well, is like when you actually call a Baron, what is your goal? What is your job to do? Like when you actually start that Baron. Once you get the Baron, it's followed immediately by the post-Baron setup. And I think the first decision you should make is, should I base or not? So I think in general, it's best if your whole team resets after you get Baron, so that your tempo is all synced up. So let's say blue team here has done the Baron, they should all base and that way they can come back on the map together. Something that I see as very problematic is either say half the team resets, so let's say these three reset and say these two still try and be quite aggressive, even though their entire team is in base. So as you can see, their tempo is not very synced. These two, they can't really pressure as much as they'd like, or if they do try and pressure, they're most likely going to die. So one thing is like, even if you don't need to base, you might want to base just to kind of be on the map with your team. Another thing that's really common is people might be kind of close to an item. So let's say that these four members have based and you want to go like, okay, Gromp, blue and wolves before you reset and you might have a big item spike with that. The problem is unless you have TP and can get back on the map, your team is most likely going to start pressuring the map and then you're going to be in base. Why can't I move the top? You're going to be in base um, and unable to kind of come out here and you're just going to be like, okay, if you have TP, this is actually okay. Um, but otherwise it's like your team, they can't really pressure as much as they'd like and they might get engaged on while you're not there. So I would say as soon as you finish the Baron, generally you should base and just kind of like spend all your gold, um, sync up with your team, and you really just want to make sure you're on the same page as everyone else. If they all stay on the map and then take a while to reset, you can do the same. So if, for example, they all go and clear stuff and then they all base, you can sync their tempo with them and that's completely fine. But just generally, you really want to use your Baron time as efficiently as possible so the earlier you can base and kind of sync up with the rest of your team, the better. With the Baron, generally, Generally you want to pressure two lanes and the reason for that is if you just go five man down mid it's quite easy for the enemy team to five man defend for that reason you kind of have to split them up um, and you normally play two waves now for which waves you actually choose to play to be honest it's quite complex and it doesn't matter as much as you think like okay I'm gonna still explain it but the most important thing is just making sure your team is like relatively grouped right but generally the things to keep in mind are you want to normally play to to the two lanes that you already kind of have vision towards. So in this situation, we have a lot of vision in top side. So it'd be really easy for us to play mid top. Um, but when you're choosing like which members to go to which lane, generally you put the four members in the lane that you want to take towers in and the one member, typically your safest member, in the lane where you kind of just want to push but you don't really want to take towers. So what's very, very common is that you have say four people top. So it'd be say like the AD mids, I guess I'll just move them up. You have like these four people top, um, you, with all your existing vision and the top laner, typically your safest member also has TP, can just kind of push mid waves here. Now the situation might be reversed if you have a top lane split pusher. If this was a Fiora, you might do the other way around. Fiora is the one looking to take um, towers in the side lane and you just kind of want to keep them all mid. So it can depend on what kind of comp, but generally you're looking to play some sort of 4-1. Um, you can also 5 mana lane, which is okay if the enemy team has very, very strong engage, um, but it is definitely less efficient and will take you longer to take towers, so you should only do it if you're very, very scared. Now there are times where you might want to play 4-1 on a lane where you don't have vision. So let's say, for example, you've taken this Baron or your vision is topside, but Dragon is spawning in, say, a minute and a half. You might want to play mid and bot instead of mid and top, um, because you want to be able to get this Dragon. You don't just want to go all top and then have the enemy team take the Dragon for free. The only problem with this is that it's very very common that after you do Baron the enemy team immediately runs to your weak side so 
you might be doing Baron, and during that time, the enemy team now knows they can no longer contest, they immediately run here. And this is super, super common in high elo, as people are then, okay, they're deploying for Baron, we're deciding to 4-1 mid and bot, um, and they walk out here and they get instantly picked. And if you get picked while you have Baron, it slows down the game a ton. So that's another pitfall that you really need to keep in mind. Um, basically, the post-Baron setup is pretty complex, if I'm honest with you guys. Um, and in solo queue, you're not going to be able to tell your teammates what to do all the time, right? Like, they're just not going to listen. So the main things are, once you get the Baron, try and sync up your tempo with your team. Don't just base at a random time. Um, and try and make sure you're pressuring two lanes. It's not going to matter unless you're playing at a very high level um, which two lanes they are, but try and just have your safest member pushing one lane um, and the other four of your members all pushing another lane. Don't waste your time like farming jungle camps and stuff where you have Baron. That's time you really need to be pressuring. Um, and generally, I think that will get you the best results. So let's show an example of what all these kind of things might look like in game. So here you can see that Cassio, Rakan, and Lee Sin, we're all ready to pressure the map, but our tempo is not synced very well. Our Zin Zhao is still farming jungle camps and Syndra is deploying out of base. So this is problematic because, well, we would really like to push up to this tower and auto attack it, but we can't. So what do you do in this situation? This is something that's going to come up a lot in solo queue because people aren't going to play perfectly. They're not going to know how to macro, they're not going to know what to do, so you have to adapt. In this sort of situation, our goal is to just not die. We just don't want to get engaged on until everyone's here. So this is something where I would see a lot of you guys in coaching sessions play too aggressively when your teammates aren't in position and then be like, oh, well, they should have been here. And yeah, you're right. They should have been there. Um, but solo queue is a lot about adaptation. So here, by playing safe on that wave, I wasn't engaged on by the Leona until my team is all here. And if you look at the map now, I've got all my teammates here and I can be as aggressive as I want. So here's a really good example of an actual macro situation that happened in one of our scrims. So you can see that we've just done the Baron and we based. Now, all our vision is top side, so we could play mid top, especially because the dragon's floating in three minutes, but in this situation, we decided to play for bot. Once again, I think possibly playing mid top is better, but what's most important is that you're all on the same page, and this is going to happen again a lot in solo queue. People aren't going to play correctly, you just need to adapt to what's going on. So if we look at this, now, three of us have base, but two of us have not, so our tempo is very desynced, and that makes walking into this weak side scary, and you saw that Nautilus was just there. Now, even though um, I don't think there's anyone with them, maybe their jungler is with them, I actually can't remember in this situation, but it's like, it's scary to walk into this weak side until all your teammates are here. Uh, and you can also see because this, the tempo is so desynced, it's actually going to take us longer than it should to kind of start pressuring the map again. Um, so like Leona, uh, me, and Noct uh, me and Rumble, uh, we're not able to move in here until Jin and Karma were back on the map. So that delays our Baron by about a wave. Um, and now obviously not the end of the world, but what would be the end of the world is if you try and pressure while your teammates are not in position to, and then you die because that would slow down your Baron a lot. Our next step is breaking the base. So the easiest way to do this is to sync up your waves, essentially make it so your waves crash at the same time. Even in solo queue, I think this is reasonably achievable if you just pay attention to the minimap and try and make the waves crash at the same time. So that means you can either um, push faster or you can just let the wave stay there until the next wave comes. So for example, if the mid wave was here, you guys might not want to kill this bot wave until this wave has reached up here. And the reason for that is it's very difficult to siege uh, like the base if you're just crashing one at a time. Their entire team can move from bot to mid at a very short distance, so it makes it very easy for them to respond and it's very difficult for your team to move through here without getting engaged on. So for that reason, if you can sync the waves, it definitely makes uh, breaking the base a lot easier. Um, but if you can't, as might be possible or might happen in solo queue, there are other ways as well. So here's an example where the waves aren't properly synced. So this is something that you're going to see in solo queue a lot. So you can see this top wave is kind of half dead by the time the mid wave is crashing, which is definitely not the most pressuring thing. So at this point, you have several things you can do. The obvious one is just letting cannon creeps hit the tower. So generally, even if you can't keep the kind of like front line and, and back line of creeps alive, you can almost always keep the cannon creep alive and that will just like slowly chip down the enemy tower. After that, it's kind of identity specific as to what you should do. So if you're playing a champion like Azir, your goal might be to poke people off the tower and try bait their engage. So you can see here, I'm just looking to poke people down. Um, at this point, the mid wave is actually dead and this new wave is arriving. So you can see our waves are not synced like at all. Um, but here, all I'm doing is I'm just like spam poking people down. I'm actually gonna go back because there was some artifacting, but you can see like my goal here is to basically just bait out their engage and try poke them down so they can't defend the tower anymore. So you know, if you're playing like control mages and stuff, this might be what you look to do. 
So as you can see, we end up winning the fight, three of them are dead, and then we're able to take the tower. So this was nothing to do with macro, and this was instead to do with your champion's identity. If you're playing a champion like Akali, clearly you can't poke under towers. So your goal instead might just be to push waves, try th threaten flanks, maybe you can look for a dive. So basically you need to identify like what is your champion's identity when you're sieging. It could be that you're poking, it could be that you're just like peeling off the engage, you could be flanking. Your goal might even just be to split push a different lane. Um, so basically you need to find a way to create value for your team when you're sieging the base and there's a variety of different ways to do that depending on what kind of champion you're playing. Now if you can with your Baron, you want to try aim to take two inhibs, so ideally a mid inhib and a side lane inhib. One thing I'll quickly say is that side lane inhibs are much more important than mid lane inhibs. So you will see when we talk about inhib pressure in a moment, but it's much easier for the enemy team to just like clear an inhib wave mid and still contest objectives or still move to other waves um, than it is for one of these side lane ones, especially uh, the bot lane inhib, because if you take the bot lane inhib, it makes it very difficult for the enemy team to, con um, to contest Baron. And actually it's the opposite. If you're fighting Dragon or fighting Elder, you can take the top lane inhib. Um, that makes it very difficult to respond to. So mid inhib is actually not super valuable. Um, but side lane inhibs are extremely valuable. Even though your goal is to take two inhibs with the Baron, if you can't, like don't force it. Oftentimes it does take multiple Barons to end the game. Just taking um, outer towers, inner towers, or even like inhib towers are all quite a lot of gold and it makes uh, ending on the next Baron quite a bit easier. That being said, if you do take inhibs, you are on a small clock because they are going to get a lot of extra farm. So if you do take the inhibs, obviously you're going to have to start pressuring quite a bit. But now let's talk about inhib pressure. Now fortunately, inhib pressure is probably the easiest thing on this list and we don't need to spend too long on it. Basically, you can think of once you get inhibs down, it's pretty much the same as a Baron setup, except this time you have a sixth man. So think of it as this top wave here is like a sixth member of your team that's going to push the wave automatically. The most important thing is once you take inhibs, don't push the same lane in general as as the lane you've taken the inhib in so if you've taken the top inhib you shouldn't then five man top unless somehow you can just like dive them and win instead you'd want to be playing towards mid or bot because that top wave is going to push anyway and they're going to have to respond to it so in this situation here we're playing a 4-1 mid and bot we've got this top inhib down which means it's going to slowly push to them so as you can see, as we're sieging bot, we're getting some kills and eventually this top wave just gets giant. And so if this game were more even, they would then be forced to respond to this wave, which would make sieging this tower a lot, lot easier. So I don't think this is going to happen that much in solo queue, not because it's not possible. I think it's relatively easy to execute, but just because a lot of the time people don't respect and it doesn't really get to this point in the game. Most likely you will just be having team fights and winning off that. But if you do get some inhibs, the most important thing to remember is just play it out like a Baron, but do not push the lane you've already got the inhib in and instead look to pressure a different lane. So let's kind of TLDR everything and put it all together. First, you have the mid game steps. The goal of the mid game steps is to give you a gold and position advantage, which should make objective fights a lot easier. Now, after objective fights, you're seeing if, okay, can we do Baron or instead, can we accelerate ourselves further? And then if we can do Baron, like we go and do Baron, there's some stuff there that you need to know your identity and stuff like that. How like the comps interact, you know, do we have enough damage, etc once you get the Baron it's all about the post Baron setup and eventually breaking the base and then once the base is broken the final step before ending the game is to use your inhib pressure so all these things combined if you master each kind of section by itself will make closing out games a lot cleaner and quicker for you so I would highly recommend focusing on one thing at a time focus first say on the mid game steps focus then on like the post Baron just depending on you know which things you find you struggle with I really recommend just focusing on one thing at a time because it is quite a lot to take in. So guys, that, that is going to be it for this video. And finally, I get to show off my fancy new outro screen. If you do have any questions about the video, please leave them below. If you liked it, go ahead and like and subscribe and please check out my socials. They're all in the description below. So that'll be it from me guys. And I'll see you next time.